heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll bring you the latest on the Israel-Hamas conflict and explore the role of intelligence and cybersecurity amid the war. Plus, we'll discuss the role social media plays in misinformation as Elon Musk's ex faces backlash over changes to its content safety policies. And we'll return to the trial of Sam Bankman fried as it enters its second week with a key witness taking the stand. Israel Hamas, the war fighting, it enters a fourth day. Joining us with the latest on an update is Bloomberg's Galit Olstein. And you're in Tel Aviv at the moment. Galit, just bring us up to speed with what you're anticipating. Yes, so, so I think actually, good evening. Um, I think uh, actually the most um, interesting development that um, we're going to be seeing today, and this is not a short thing yet, um, will be that Israel is uh, actually looking at a new government. Um, we've been getting uh, messages this afternoon that Israel's ruling coalition said that it wants to form a rare emergency government with the opposition following Saturday's attacks by uh, Hamas. And uh, they're now finalizing the final details. So, you know, we cannot say that this is... Uh, um, surely going to happen, but it does look like this is going to happen. And in essence, what this means is that the entire uh, operation in Gaza that we're that we're looking at and that all Israeli officials are saying will um, be taking a long time, maybe several weeks or more than that um, ahead. Then uh, that will be run by um, a very um, narrow, small war cabinet that will be comprised of um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's party and opposition leaders Benny Gantz party with the other parties that are parties that are more nationalist, more far right, out of the picture, only for that, only for the war operation. And then after the war, we'll see what happens politically. But that's the most significant development that we're looking at today. Uh, Gali, you, you and your colleagues in our in our bureau, and actually on this program, we, we talked to some of those that have been part of the mobilization effort, 300,000 reservists, many of them technology industry workers. What is the latest sort of military response and action on the ground in Israel? Yes. Yes, so, so that is um, an interesting question. And today um, we've been actually hearing a lot of IDF officials speak to us about the focus now being aerial attacks on Gaza. And the chief uh, IDF spokesperson tells us um, this morning that the attacks that have been taking place, especially last night, but throughout the last 36 hours or so have been unprecedented precedented in the terms that they are very fierce. Um, what the Air Force now is doing is Gaza, that they're striking in rounds that are taking place every every four hours. They're just going back and forth. Um, they're striking um, thousands of targets um, over there. They have also um, reported that they have managed um, to um, kill from, from with these aerial attacks to senior figures in Hamas this afternoon. So that's what the focus is on now. And they're also describing that they've sort of built a steel wall, that's what they call it, along the Gaza fence in order to stop any more possible infiltrations. So they've actually placed a lot of tanks over there and some aerial vehicles that are shooting down at anyone. And that's what they stress, yes. anyone who's trying to shoot across the fence, no matter who they are. And that's the main focal point of what the, the Israeli Air Force is doing now. Just in one more sentence, I will tell you that obviously they are preparing for a much larger ground operation and they're doing that by mobilizing a lot of soldiers and reserve forces towards the, the southern border and the northern border as well. Uh, Bloomberg's Gali Olstein, one of many colleagues in Israel and the Middle East, Caro, who are doing minute by minute reporting of what's happening. We're very grateful to have you here on Bloomberg Technology. Let's turn to the intelligence side of this conversation. How did Hamas get around one of the most sophisticated surveillance states to stage its attack against Israel? Joining us now is Kirsten Todd, the former chief of staff for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure, Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. There's the hard war, hard tech component, and then there's the soft power, soft tech component. What have you learned about 
Hamas's cyber activity in what has been 48 hours already since the attack? Well, first of all, uh, thanks so much, Ed. It's incredibly early in this crisis, um, but we're seeing just the increased escalation over the last few days. Um, we're now seeing deaths over 1,000, potentially over 1,600 hostages being taken, and the concern that there's going to be a second front, certainly on the northern side uh, with Hezbollah. What American intelligence officials need to be asking right now, they are asking, is what direct role, if any, did Iran have in the supplying, the preparation, uh, the encouraging of this attack? We know that Iran views its alliance with Hamas as a point of leverage as it's looking to destabilize and derail uh, the uh, engagements with Israel and Saudi Arabia. And so certainly civilian casualties on both, side, uh, both sides would uh, obstruct any attempt toward uh, a type of agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So the tools available to all sides are not just kinetic. It's not just the fierce uh, fighting that uh, Galit just talked about. There are cyber weapons and cyber tools, which we know everybody has access to. Let's talk about those cyber weapons, cyber tools already being deployed. You say it's very early days in the crisis. Already we've seen cyber attacks being aimed at both sides. Can you tell us sort of what these look like in the early iterations and whether they're going to be ramped up as days go forward? It's hard to know where, where they will escalate to, but certainly right now um, we're seeing unofficial reports of DDoS attacks, the use of malware, uh, defacement of websites. Uh, we saw back in 2011, 2012 that Iran uh, used DDoS attacks against the United States financial uh, sector. The capabilities of all nation states uh, in cyber uh, are enough. They're not necessarily as sophisticated as, as Russia or China, but we know that the capabilities exist and that if there is a war that is going to access all tools that cyber could be used in lieu of kinetic weapons, but uh, more likely in conjunction with kinetic, kinetic weapons. I mean, interestingly, Rob Joyce, Director of Cybersecurity over the, the National Security Agency, he's saying thus far cyber component hasn't been that significant. It has been more of these denial of service elements, but that they could ramp up. I, I'm interested as to how difficult it is to pass through who are hacktivists, where are they coming from, and what really the end goal is here. Well, it's a, it's a great question because what we're looking at right now really is how can we be resilient. Rob is absolutely right. I mean, what we're seeing, uh, we're not seeing any uh, targeted attacks at this point. Um, but what we want to be really aware of is how can we prepare? How can we be resilient against what could come? When we saw uh, the imminence of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, CISA put out a shields up advisory to critical infrastructure companies to say, uh, heighten your awareness, heighten your vigilance, lower the threshold for reporting. What we're talking about now isn't necessarily what we know to be coming, but the importance of being prepared, being resilient, and being vigilant as we create a more resilient infrastructure for the United States. Kirsten, you're talking about preparedness. Yesterday, Professor Chuck Freilich of Columbia, former Deputy National Security Advisor in Israel, said that this wasn't a lack of intelligence. It was a lack of imagination, that the security and intelligence forces just didn't think that something of that scale could happen because they couldn't imagine it. Put that in the cyber context for us. You seem to be suggesting that a lot of that competence and know-how would come from the Iran side or a third-party actor, not necessarily Hamas itself. It's hard to know. Certainly Iran has these capabilities. And as I said, we've seen Iran use cyber capabilities. I think your point about failure of imagination is obviously... Not, not my point. Sorry. Professor <laughs> the Chuck Freilich's point. Yeah. <laughs> um, brings us, unfortunately, back to 9-11 and what we look at as human nature. We often prepare for that which we know we can respond to. Our challenge is the ability to prepare for that which is more frightening, more devastating, more destructive. And so when we're preparing, we have to be thinking about how can cyber play a role in this and what do we need to be doing again to be uh, to prevent to prepare and importantly to be resilient you were with CISA through July of this year I want to ask you about Palantir and the private public relationship that there have been loads of questions posed about Palantir over the weekend do you have any experience you can draw on or opinion on the role that the private sector could play in the intelligence and cyberspace data related going forward 
One of the things that I was so pleased with and proud to be a part of at CISA and with the federal government is the improved relationship between industry and government in threat intelligence, uh, in the ability to share information. The solar winds attack that happened back in 2020 was uh, identified by the company FireEye. And the ability then for uh, the private sector to share information with government, for government to do the same in real time so that we can create a not a complete threat intelligence picture, but certainly a more comprehensive one so that coming together, industry and government can respond. We know that one entity can't respond and retaliate on its own, respond and react, that we've got to be able to work together. So great to get your CISA experience. And of course, now as CEO of Liberty Group Ventures, Kirsten Todd, thank you for your time today. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're going to be turning back to the markets for a look at just how these geopolitical moments are impacting all well, the investment space at last. Do stick with us. This is Bloomberg Technology. Now, amid the current heightened geopolitical tensions, central banks, they seem to be the catalyst for today's trading action, at least. Joining us now to break down the short term, the long term in terms of your technology sector, Hilary Frisch. We're very well pleased to welcome for Senior Research Analyst at Technology Software at Clearbridge. Hilary, give us your sort of bird's eye perspective right now. When we are in the throes of knee-jerk reactions, when we do see sell-offs become something that is the immediate response to a geopolitical threat and concern, is that the right way to be thinking about your technology investments right now? It's a very good question. Thanks for having me, Caroline and Ed. It's good to be here. Um, it's, uh, you know, what's interesting is we haven't seen that knee-jerk sell-off this time mm -hmm. so far. <laughs> uh, I think the market is interpreting a relatively isolated circumstance. We'll see if that proves to be the case. Uh, at Clearbridge, we tend to be long-term investors. We take a long-term horizon. We like to use periods of weakness to add to key portfolio positions. In technology specifically, well, I don't see Q3 in particular as any kind of barn burner quarter or a major catalyst either way for the sector. Uh, I do see a period between now and mid to late next year when we should actually see technology start to decouple in terms of growth from the broader economy. That's partly due to AI and a variety of other factors, but I do see technology as a place where investors will want to continue to invest. And which particular drivers, which you know, forces of change do you focus in on when you think of an NVIDIA which has had parabolic growth in terms of its overall market valuation based on an AI fundamental viewpoint, but also is exposed to geopolitical tensions when it comes to China, US, when it has to maybe even some exposure in terms of supply chain with Israel. How do you dissect what really ultimately needs to be a long-term view? Sure. Well, NVIDIA aside, because there are certain factors driving their results versus others, most tech companies have exposure. Some are the exposure in Israel and, and such places. Uh, and the long-term geopolitical situation is a dynamic one. But I don't see associated disruption as the primary concern. Mm -hmm. the, as we've seen from the markets, the primary concern has been the rising dollar in interest rates. They've had a better quarter than anyone else out there. And that puts near-term pressure on translated revenues and earnings and also on valuations. But um, to the extent that these types of conflicts don't grow out of control, uh, it pre they tend to present opportunities to invest in long-term trends. Uh, it's interesting because yesterday we saw security companies rally. I think they're rallying again today. And security companies are some of the ones with the largest exposure to Israel. Some of them are based in Israel or were based in Israel and have dual headquarters. Uh, but in periods of rising geopolitical t uh, tension, there tends to be heightened adoption of security, mm. uh, security solutions. So it's a push and pull between what that disruption looks like and what the outcome looks like in terms of increased revenues. And we live in a remote work world. Technology pioneered remote work. They were doing it long before we were as a broader economy with the pandemic. So um, we've seen circumstances where companies can adapt fairly quickly. But in Israel, they're deploying a lot of folks. They're deploying a lot of reservists of working age. So there could be just some disruptions along the way. Uh, Hillary, it's Ed in San Francisco. Do, do you like charts? You, you strike me as somebody that, that's a chart watcher that likes charts. 
I wonder what makes you say that, but I don't dislike charts. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's bring up one chart. I want you to explain something to me. NASDAQ 100 against the S&P 500 software index year to date. The S&P 500 software index is a very limited basket, but it has kind of enterprise, SaaS, cyber, and then Microsoft's in there as well. They're basically up the same amount year to date. What, what is it then that's driving those software names, higher multiple or otherwise right now? If it isn't Fed, if it isn't geopolitical risk, what is your outlook based on? Investors like to focus on higher technology multiples as though growth were equivalent between tech and the broader economy. But growth is not equivalent between tech and the broader economy. Technology is where nearly all of the growth has been coming from. So in this recent uh, period where we had rising dollar and rising interest rates, tech actually outperformed the broader economy in S&P. Uh, with AI and the precursor investments to AI and a normalization of spending environment in tech, which I believe has been in a recession, a very mild recession over the course of the better part of the last year, uh, that looks poised to be the case even more so going forward. Tech valuations uh, with software as a proxy for enterprise tech are just at their uh, five-year pre-pandemic average. They're just a hair above their 10-year pre-pandemic average, meaning excluding the pandemic period where valuations were really elevated. I think that's a decent backdrop for tech into 2024, where in second half, I expect AI to be much more of a catalyst. We could talk about that more if you like. Well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Hillary Frisch of Clearbridge. And that was a loaded question. I know you like charts. Who doesn't like charts? <laughs> we follow How the technology sector. Like a bit. Exactly. But it is good to have you back on the program. We'll have you back very soon. It is time for Talking Tech, and first up, Ubisoft fell the most since May after the French video game maker delayed the release of its new free-to-play game, X Defiant, originally scheduled this summer. The company cited, quote, inconsistencies in the game experience as the cause of the delay. And worldwide personal computer shipments declined 9% in the third quarter, hitting what Gartner analysts expected will be the low point in a two-year market slump. Apple had the steepest drop among the major PC makers, with shipments falling 24% from the same quarter a year earlier. Plus, the stock of China's biggest food delivery platform, Meituan, has almost halved since a peak in January, with global active fund managers offloading $3.7 billion dollars of the company's shares this year. This makes it the most sold Chinese tech firm during that period, according to Morgan Stanley. Caroline. Great set of stories, Ed. Meanwhile, look, let's get up to speed with what's happening just over in another part of New York right now. Sam Bankman frieds trial. We want to get to Bloomberg Shanali Basak outside the U.S. District Courthouse in downtown Manhattan. And Shanali, there's a pretty key witness that everyone's waiting for with bated breath. Uh, there are very many key witnesses hitting the stand right now. We were waiting on Caroline Ellison to take the stand. Of course, she is the pivotal witness, both for the prosecution as well as the defense. We know that there may be some key evidence that also comes to light in the sake of this trial in the middle of her testimony. For example, diary entries that have been largely talked about the last couple of months leaked earlier to the New York Times. This idea here that she had a lot of discomfort in running Alameda, her own abilities to take a leadership role there and conflicts with Sam himself. We know that Caroline and uh, Sam had been on and on, on and on again, off again dating. Uh, remember, she was his girlfriend, so knew a lot of the intimate workings of Sam at Alameda and in his personal life. Right now, the testimony of Gary Wang, who is also an FTX co-founder, is also wrapping up, getting a lot of very interesting details about what happened in those uh, dire days of November when FTX was about to fall, and then also even earlier when he was required to write the code that ultimately led to the back door that Alameda had used to take money out of FTX. You're also hearing about how he came to the agreement with prosecutors as well, to which he had pled guilty and agreed to cooperate in this trial. So that is wrapping up inside as we speak. And to your point, Caroline Ellison will take the stand just this afternoon. Now, Shanali, give me some of the drama and color of the courtroom. I've stood where you're standing weeks and weeks in a trial like this. This is Caroline Ellison's first public appearance, and it's important for prosecutors, right? This is a big moment for them. 
this is the biggest moment. She is such a critical part of this trial. Remember, prosecutors themselves say only a very small number of people really knew what was going on inside of FTX and Alameda and the extent to which this alleged, alleged fraud was carried out. Now, remember, when you think about Caroline and her role at Alameda, she was the CEO of the hedge fund in question here that has said to have been taking money out of FTX in two different ways, through the wallets and through fiat itself. Now, remember, you were talking about the star-studded trial here, Caroline speaking for the first time, such a critical part of the defense. You, this is the second week of what will be a six-week trial to which many, uh, many journalists from early in the morning, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., many spectators have been outside waiting around the courthouse here. Now they're all inside, so you don't see them as we stand out here now. But yes, it has certainly been very highly watched. There has been a lot of commotion outside the courthouse itself, and there will be many more people coming to try throughout the couple of weeks, including Anthony Scaramucci, whose yeah. uh, Skybridge had taken money from FTX in the form of a 30% stake. Well battled the traffic noise, Shanani. Stood out there for hour after hour. We really appreciate it. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. One of the top stories that we're tracking on Bloomberg and Bloomberg Technology is X, the company and platform formerly known as Twitter, facing criticism over changes made to its content safety policies that have led to confusion, misinformation around the conflict between Israel and Hamas. X has responded to our reporting saying this is the first crisis as X, and this means we're all eyes, hands, hearts on across all divisions and have put into place our crisis protocol, all teams, policy products, operations, escalation, and much more. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Asia Count. What we're talking about here is largely video content circulating on X and other platforms that purports to be one thing, but based on the research groups we spoke to and community notes, users flagging it is actually something completely different. Yeah, it's a huge problem, right? So as you just mentioned to X's response, the challenge is, is that some of these posts, videos, and images have received millions of views. They've ended up on TikTok and Facebook, QAnon forums, far-right websites, and it's not verified. And researchers have found time and time again posts that are showing videos of conflicts that are from video games or from other conflicts that are not this conflict, fake statements from the White House. I mean, it's, it's a huge problem, and researchers are saying this is something that they haven't seen. It's unprecedented. And to the point that it's unprecedented is this suddenly well more significant use of artificial intelligence by those that are putting some of the disinformation out there is it a lack of well technology as a way to fight back at some of this misinformation target what are we seeing not only at x but across the board whether it be tiktok whether it be facebook I think it's a couple of things. It, sh it surely could be partially from, from AI. I think with X specifically, it's about the changes that Musk has made since he took over the platform. So the misinformation policy was rolled back. So the policy now is that things can stay up. Maybe the visibility is limited. But again, as we've seen, it hasn't really been that limited. If millions of people are viewing some of these posts, they've cut a lot of people on their content safety teams and election integrity, people that are normally responsible for trying to see information on the site. They've made it harder for researchers to access data on the site. So it's all of those factors together that have made it really difficult. And then not even to mention the verification process and being able to just buy a blue check mark so it's hard to tell who is a trusted voice in some of these issues. Just an update for our audience. Linda Yaccarino, who is the CEO of X, was due to speak at a w Wall Street Journal event this week and has cancelled it, I'm told, so she can specifically be on hand to deal with this crisis. But you, you mentioned verification. Just quickly, this isn't unique to X, but what we're seeing is verified users share across platforms in the case of that false White House statement as an example. Yeah, exactly, right? There was a, a statement that someone put out supposedly from the White House that said they were going to authorize billions of dollars in aid in Israel. Turns out what a researcher found was that that was actually a statement about Ukraine that someone doctored to look differently. And to your point, you have verified users, so you might think that it's a trusted source because you see that blue check mark, and it's really not. It's just someone who paid $8 a month who maybe has not done any reporting or hasn't really looked and, and tried to verify the facts, or could it actually be a bad actor who's intentionally trying to spread misleading information to increase engagement on the site. Asia Counts, thank you so much for bringing us the latest when it comes to technology's role within, well, your consumption of what is news. 
right or wrong. Let's talk about the role of social media within this war as we know it. We're welcoming Yael Eisenstadt, Vice President at the American Defamation League Center for Technology and Society. And Yael, great to have you here. Of course, you are with an institution that is all about, you know, holding disinformation to account in many ways and anti-hate organization is the key focus of your work. How are you seeing this different, this particular moment different from what we've seen in prior episodes of conflict? Sure. So as you just pointed out, at, at ADL, we have been tracking this kind of work, both anti-Semitic incidents in the real world, as well as how hate and disinformation proliferates online for decades. Mm. And what we are seeing right now, I mean, Aisha just brought up some of the issues going on, particularly on X. But part of the problem is X used to be the place when it was Twitter that people went to in times of a real-time crisis. Let's be clear, it was never perfect before. But it was at least a place where people knew who were journalists, people knew who were verified accounts. They had some sort of way of figuring out who to follow and what information may be more credible than others. And all the things we've been highlighting as really concerning changes at the company over the last year are now really showing why it matters. We are seeing not just disinformation and misinformation proliferate on the platform, but I mean, if I can just give you a few examples. Yeah. So just yesterday, I saw, you know, my team saw a video from an account. Aisha had brought up the verification blue check process from a blue check bot, as in an automated account who pays $8 a month to get that blue check, which means he's prioritized in our news feeds with a fake video saying it was Hamas executing hostages. Now, what's interesting is not only is that video still up as of last I checked about an hour ago and being, been viewed hundreds of thousands of times, there is no way for a user to flag it as mis or disinformation. If you look at the drop down menu of how to flag content, there is no option for disinformation. But they would say there's community notes. How has that been helping hindering from your perspective? They would say that, and while community notes in and of itself might be a really interesting experiment to think about for the future, it is not the way to moderate content during a real crisis. And to be clear, it's not just about what's happening on the ground right now, but we at, at ADL are also concerned about the potential to proliferate anti-Semitism here at home, we have extremists and anti-Semites anti who were re-platformed over the past year on X, reveling in some of this violence and actually saying some of the most horrendous anti-Semitic things online. And I, I really, really am happy to see X's statement that they are proactively going to monitor for this, but I just have to be frank, right now I'm not seeing that yet. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for joining us on the show. While we've been on air, X have sent us some data saying that Community Notes has generated close to 30 million impressions and that 500 unique notes on the X platform directly relate to the, ta the attacks that's based on three days of activity. What I really want to ask you about is the positive story of social media. A lot of the engagement that we've had on the program and indeed some of the guests that have joined were through social media channels. There are people trying on various platforms to identify those that are missing. Have you any um, uh, evidence or have you seen any positive use cases of social media in the Israel-Hamas conflict over the last three days? So to your point, I'll start with community notes. Again, yes, I think it's actually a really great way for people to be able to crowdsource information, to fact check in real time. The problem is it's putting the responsibility on the user for doing that as opposed to the platform itself. So while community notes is definitely an interesting positive potential step, it cannot be the only thing for curbing this kind of disinformation. And you know, this might not fit the word positive, but it is really actually important to see just how horrific the crimes are right now that are happening on the ground in Israel. And that does happen on social media. And, and we can debate whether terrible images online is useful, but to be able to see some of the very on the ground reporting, to know that a grandmother was murdered in her own home 
while they filmed it on her own phone and uploaded it to her own Facebook feed. That's the type of thing we can only see if we have people really being able to report in real time. So that is a positive use. You can get so many voices that are not normally the voices that might surface. The challenge though, is how to differentiate that from the noise, from the blue checks, from the people who are purposely glorifying violence or seeding anti-Semitic conspiracy theories to change the narrative here. Yeah, thank you for your time here. Yeah, Eisenstadt of the Anti-Defamation League. Now, Ed, we turn to you. Yeah, we, we will keep this conversation going. And coming up on the show, we're going to look at the impact of the war on the region's tech scene, not just Israel, but broader than that. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. We continue to monitor what's happening in the Middle East. On today's VC Spotlight, we want to welcome Mahmoud Kweis for his take on how the Israel-Hamas war is going to impact both the Israeli and Palestinian tech sectors. Mahmoud is a Jerusalem-based founder and CEO of software company Tech Clinic, which has operations in both Jerusalem and Ramallah in the Central West Bank. He's also a researcher at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Mahmoud, welcome to... Bloomberg Technology, you have on the ground connection to what is happening uh, to the technology sector uh, in both the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. What can you tell us about the situation for the technology industry, workers and founders that you know? Yes, well, thank you very much, Ed and uh, Caroline, for hosting me. Um, I would I would start saying that uh, we learned a lot from COVID and um, we we adapted very quickly. There was a, uh, a shutdown of our services for uh, for one day or one and a half day. Then we recapped and our staff started to work uh, from home on a 70 percent um, effort, not 100 percent effort. We have people working from Gaza, people working from Ramallah, and other people working from Jerusalem. So, um, and um, the, the fact on the ground that the, the company is still uh, running and other companies are also still, uh, still running, the, uh, this situation in Gaza, <clears throat> this situation in Gaza and all the borders of Gaza has uh, affected uh, a lot the economy, but with the, uh, with the tech, it is uh, less affected, I, uh, I believe. Because of the type of services that we provide, it's the services, we, we don't go to factories. We work mm -hmm. from, uh, from our offices, from our home. All, you need, all, our, all you, what we need is a laptop and uh, cloud. Mahmoud, you're doing software development, outsourcing, testing, innovation, business development. I'm interested as to how intertwined those sort of supply chains, those dependencies, that service is between Israel and Palestinians. How much are you seeing that they depend on each other? Well, I believe that most of the tech industry in uh, in Palestine depends on uh, depends on Israeli on the Israeli market, uh, together with the European and the US market. But the majority, I could claim that the majority are depending on the Israeli market, and there are lots of cooperation between the uh, Palestinian uh, tech companies and entrepreneurs with the Israeli market um, uh, and and entrepreneurs. Um, uh, there is no specific statistics that calculates this, but um, talks uh, uh, from the media and some uh, sources from the articles in the media. There are some 31 companies in uh, in Palestine, like in West Bank and Gaza, who are uh, giving services to uh, Israeli um, uh, tech companies and multinational companies also operating from Israel, such as Nokia, um, uh, Apple, Microsoft, and uh, and other companies. So the dependency is very, very high on, uh, on the Israeli market. Now, during the situation, there was a little bit of uh, um, not closing down, but hold on with some uh, some projects. I was talking to some uh, founders. Uh, some of their Israeli clients has stopped their operation for a while until things are not vague uh, anymore. And uh, I believe that life would go to, uh, to normal. But with regards to the um, other clients in the US and in Europe, uh, our team in Gaza are still operating. Um, 
under cautions, uh, yes, uh, it's it's a risky situation, but they're still operating uh, and providing yeah. services to our Europe uh, client. Mahmoud, you, you recently stepped down in the last 10 days or so as the chair of 5050, an accelerator, a VC accelerator essentially that tried to back founders that work cross-border, Palestinian and Israeli. Do, do you have a sense of sort of the lasting impact of, of the, the, t- the talent pool in the Gaza Strip or indeed in the West Bank? You know, will we see technology startups coming out of those regions in the future? Oh, yes. Well, I, I do believe in that. For the last five years, I was joined, I was on the board of 5050, and uh, I've seen the mar- remarkable uh, evidences on the ground of companies uh, co-authored and co-founded by uh, Israeli and Palestinian uh, co-founders. Those companies are still uh, are still running. Only this year, in September, uh, nine companies were uh, were established with. Uh, to Israel with Israeli and Palestinian co-founders. And uh, we are targeting the uh, intellectual Palestinian and intellectual Israelis with masters and PhD degrees, people with ha- who have patents in, uh, in and research on their ideas and uh, those who ha- they have uh, lots of opportunities to uh, to win. Yeah. Now um, let me let me also uh, add that the um, uh, Israel is more advanced in uh, in tech than uh, than Palestine, and this is why I joined this 5050, and I was leading 5050 in order to uh, transfer some knowledge from uh, from Israel into into Palestine, and from the the US also. And uh, this is why we have partnered with Tel Aviv University with Israeli College of Engineering. Those are two uh, leading Israeli uh, in, uh, ac- academic institutions, uh, yeah. together with Northeastern University in Boston. You, of course, bring your academia to the table, of course, with your as a researcher for Harvard Kennedy Belfast Center. I'm interested as to your perspective on what what are the industries that we've seen really unique ideas come out of within tech from Palestinian entrepreneurs? What are they looking to solve? Well, um, there, there are many Palestinians are human beings, uh, same as Israelis, same as others. So it is uh, what they lack is the platform that can have uh, have them and uh, incubate uh, incubate them. Currently, the uh, the incubator uh, and the environment in Palestine are not enabling enough for those uh, ideas, but we're talking about uh, innovation AI in uh, computing and uh, quantum computing and agriculture, food tech, fintech, uh, and many, many other uh, industries. It is the same as the whole world. We are very much exposed to the uh, to the international community and to the international innovation in, in the whole world. We are part, lots of uh, our youth are part of the World Economic Forum and they join the uh, many conferences all over the world. So uh, we have different sources of knowledge that we bring into Palestine. And besides, uh, besides that, uh, Palestinians are known of highly educated, uh, educated people. Like the uh, the majority of Palestinians have uh, a BA degree, like a bachelor degree. And uh, this is a good pool of talents that we can uh, contribute to the uh, yes. to the world solution. A truly cross-border conversation. Mahmoud Kwais, thank you so much, CEO of Tech Clinic. We thank you. The writer's strike is over after a tough hot summer for Hollywood, but the troubles are not over for Bob Iger. Disney's legendary CEO came out of retirement to save the company right in time for its 100th birthday, but nothing has really gone his way so far. Let's break down the details with Bloomberg's Thomas Buckley. You've done this kind of big takedown in Business Week. Tell me about the magazine piece. Absolutely. So the magazine piece, Ed, um, looks at the return of Chief Executive Officer um, of the Walt Disney Company, Bob Iger, who left the company um, in 2021 as Executive Chairman, before that as CEO in February 2020. He came back to the helm of Disney in November of last year, and so far nothing at all has gone his way. I think that the TV business is in a decaying state that he had not anticipated fully. The streaming service is losing hundreds of millions of dollars every quarter, and he desperately needs 
it to be profitable by next year to honor a pledge that he made to Wall Street. He has yet to find a successor, and speculation is rampant on Wall Street that he's looking to potentially break up the company to extract value in that direction. Absolutely fascinating take about whether or not he once upon a time was looking for Apple to be the buyer and indeed whether or not he saw his future really remaining with the business. 30 seconds, Thomas. I, has he lost his allies? I think, look, a number of his allies during his first tenure that really helped shape the success of his first tenure have now since left the company. He's actually got a few allies left at the company, and that's led him to reappoint two of his former successors in waiting to advise him on selling different parts of the business. So that's not to say that he's lacking support from his employee base. I think that most, relieves are, most employees are still very relieved that he is back. But nonetheless, I think that he certainly doesn't have the cohort that he used to have um, supporting the success of his first tenure during his second term. I really urge everyone to go grab a cup of coffee, sit down with this piece, because it's a long read, but it's a great read. Bloomberg's Thomas Buckley, we thank you so much for it. Meanwhile, some breaking news on Caroline Ellison. She is indeed saying that Sam bankman fried directed her to commit crimes. We have so much more in the crypto show coming up next on Bloomberg. You don't want to miss it. This is Bloomberg Technology.